Will you please pray with me? Heavenly Father, we ask now as we look to your word that you would be glorified once more. Lord, help us to, to not pay attention to all of the distractions that come into uh, our lives. Uh, even as we are here to worship you, Lord, we, we recognize that our thoughts tend to go elsewhere. God, I pray that they would be centered upon you. So, Lord, help us to hear you clearly and to live obediently to all that you call us to. It's in your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. So, have you ever been in a situation where the way that you respond to it goes against all of the expectations and norms of those around you? Uh, this one time, I was out to dinner with, uh, with some pastors from the Dominican Republic. Uh, the church I attended at the time, we were heavily involved, uh, heavily in involved with mission work there. And we were building a church, uh, a school. And so one year for our missions conference, the church invited the pastor and his family to Erie. In February, so this family coming from the Dominican Republic comes to Erie in February to speak with us what, you know, about what ministry is like in their home, their home area there. One night during the conference, the pastor invited some of us out to dinner. Now, I won't name the place because it will date me, but let's say it rhymed with Fifi's. So we go to this place that sounds like Fifi's, and there were a lot of us there that night. Uh, different leaders of the church, a few teachers, the pastor's family, and, and this family from the Dominican. And so this pastor from the Dominican, he has his five-year-old son with them, and this child began to complain of a headache. And, and it's probably from the frantic pace, you know, being in a different culture. The food was different, especially at Fifi's, it was different. Um, I'm sure it, it, it was a lot for a five-year-old to take in. And so when this child said he had a headache, what did all of the women gathered around the table do? Well, if someone here says he or she has a headache, then we were all like, here, take a pill. And so all these women started reaching into their purses to give this little kid a, a pill to alleviate his headache. I mean, that was the nice thing to do. It's, it's what we do. It's what our society says we should do. Somebody's sick, you take a pill. And then as this family is being bombarded with offers of Tylenol and aspirin and Motrin and every other pain reliever drug that, that every woman had stashed in her purse, the father finally politely uh, stopped them. And at first, all of these mothers were kind of put off, like, dude, can't you see your, I don't know if they said dude, it was like mainly older women, so probably did not say dude. But they're like, can't you see that your child is hurting? The, the, the loving thing to do is for him to take this pill so that he can begin to feel better. And I think the father kind of sensed their thoughts. And so he gently said, ladies, you have to remember where we are from, we do not have access to medicine like this. And so when we are not feeling well, we pray. We pray to God that he would take away what we are experiencing and bring his healing to us. And it was fascinating to see the faces of everybody. I couldn't see my face, but I was probably making the same face. All of us at the table, we all kind of looked at each other like, well, yeah, I guess, like you pray, you know. Um, I share that story not as a commentary about whether it's wrong for Christians to, to take medicine or not. Our cupboard, if you come to our kitchen and you say you have a headache, guess what? We have, a, we have this one, we have this one, we have that. Like, what do you need? And it's, unfortunately, it seems the older I get, the more acquainted I become with all of these pain reliever medicines. The point of the story is to show there are times where God would have us do something that goes against the culture or society because his ways are different. They are higher. They are not the ways of the world. And even when those ways seem to be or they are well-intentioned, they still 
can, can not be God's ways. And so we as his followers, we need to be more committed to his way than we would uh, to the, what the world expects of us. So today we're going to continue our look at the Gospel of John. And one of the ways uh, to read this gospel, if you haven't picked up on this, um, if, you, if you're reading through John, notice how often they talk about festivals, things going on in Jerusalem. In John 1, he starts it this way. He says, Christ came and dwelt with us. The Greek word for dwelt is the same word as tabernacled. It's the same word for the Feast of Tabernacles. So John, at the beginning, he's, he's kind of making these connections to different feasts in Jerusalem. And so with that one word, we can see how John kind of structures his gospel around these different festivals, these big gatherings in Jerusalem. In John 3 and 4, we see that Jesus was in Jerusalem for the Passover, and that uh, it was then that he was able to have the conversation with Nicodemus. And as he was returning from there, that is when he had his encounter with the woman at the well. And so today uh, we looked at John 5, and what we read from John 5, up till the first half of John 10, they are all centered around this particular festival. Like it's not all in Jerusalem, but this was kind of the, the event that brings all of these different things about in John 5 through John 10. So please turn in your Bibles or turn your Bibles on to John 5. We're going to read verses 1 through 18 today. John 5, 1. After this, a Jewish festival took place. And Jesus went up to Jerusalem. We're not sure what the exact festival uh, was that, that brought him to Jerusalem, but the intent of saying that there was a festival was to bring Christ back to Jerusalem. And that phrase, after this, it's vague for a reason. It could have been months after the events of the woman at the well. It could have been a year or more after the events of the woman at the well. Verse 2. By the Sheep Gate in Jerusalem, there is a pool called Bethesda in Aramaic, which has five colonnades. So this is one of these verses. For much of the history of the church, doubters of the validity of, the, of scriptures would look to this verse and say, See, you can't trust the Bible because who, nobody in the ancient world would build a Pentagon-type shaped building in ancient Jerusalem. Five colonnades, I mean, who in the world would do that? So their hang-up was this idea of having these five colonnades. So the first thing we have to ask ourselves, because we haven't or we've forgotten what it was like to be, or all the information we had about, um, I don't know why we studied architecture, in high school, I'm sure some of you remember the three different types of columns. I don't remember, that was Cor Corinthian was one, I think, and I don't remember the others. But um, so there's these different ways that these buildings were built in the ancient world. So a colonnade is a series of columns used to support the weight of a roof. So you would have all of these different columns set up and they would all hold up the roof or something of the building. Um, there are ancient ones like this one. Here's one where there's just a bunch of ruins of a, of a uh, colonnade. They were used to encompass an area and kind of close it in, but still be open to the outside. Uh, we have examples of colonnades, obviously, in our um, in our world, in our country, the, the U.S. Capitol building, uh, you see uh, barely in that picture, but you can see how the colonnades were used. Here is a picture of my high school. Now, that is not when I went to high school. I did not go in cars like that. <laughs> But this is a picture before the trees grew up around my high school. And isn't she a beauty? Strong Vincent High School, no longer a high school. All of my schools, I closed down every single one of my schools. I, you might remember one of my sermons before I said, every school.
school I've attended except for college was closed, well, guess what? My college closed. Edinburgh University is no more. It's now some weird Western Pennsylvania something something. Um, I, would, I wouldn't mind seeing my seminary closed down, but that's, that's another story. So you have all of these different examples of colonnades. And so for about 1,800 years, people would doubt the validity of this story because it seemed strange to have five colonnades for a structure. And then one day, 1850s or so, um, there, the, the pool was discovered. And the archaeologists began their work, and guess what they discovered? Uh, here are a couple pictures of the site. And as you can see in the pictures, um, they, you can see uh, some of the different colonnades. Um, here's, uh, 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 I forgot to put one of the pictures up. Here's another one of the, um, the site of the Pool of Bethesda. What they ended up finding out is if you picture like a, a figure eight. So you had one, two, three, four, and five. So those were your different colonnades, the two on the sides, the two on the top and bottom, and one in the middle. So what they ended up discovering in 1850, after all of these years of saying, no, there is no such thing as a pool of Bethesda like this, who would build a building with five colonnades, you can't trust the Bible, all of these other things, lo and behold, what the scoffers did not think anybody would do, there was a colonnade that was used to separate the two pools. So there were actually two pools at the Pool of Bethesda. And what they found out was this particular pool was what was called a mikvah. It's a ceremonial pool that people would go to to wash themselves in preparation for worship. And so what would happen is you would have the upper pool that would feed clean water into the lower pool so that the people in the lower pool would be able to, to have constantly uh, flowing water. And so once again, 1800 years, people doubted the validity of scripture only to be shown that yes, indeed, what we read in there can be trusted. So Jesus and his followers, they go to the pool, and we pick up the story once more, verse 3. Within these lay a large number of the disabled, blind, lame, and paralyzed. So picture in those colonnades, large columns on both sides, and it was within those colonnades, not like in the courtyard, but within the colonnades, that these disabled people would lie. Verse 4. Some of you, if you're looking at your Bibles, Jacob, are you panicking? Can you uh, show us verse 4? Why? There isn't one. Uh, look in your Bibles. Do you see a verse 4? Some of you might. Some of you might not. Some of you are like, what are you talking about? What about the rest of verse 3? I didn't even finish verse 3 yet. Some of you are like, wait, I don't have a verse 4. And some of you are like, well, I do. I have a verse 4. If you're reading the CSB Bible, you will notice that the verses go from verse 3 to verse 5. If you're reading an NIV Bible, you will see that verse 4, I believe, is right where it should be. So why are people hating on verse 4? No matter what version of the Bible you are reading, you should see a little footnote around verse 3 that explains what happened. So first, let's read the contested verses here. Verse 3, within these lay a large number of the disabled, blind, lame, and paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water, because an angel would go down into the pool from time to time and stir up the water. Then the first one, got in, um, then the first one who got in after the water was stirred up, recovered from whatever ailment he had. Now, if you read the first part of verse 3 and continued to verse 5, you really do not miss much other than this little bit of information pertaining, uh, pertaining to why people would rush to get into the water. And if you're copying this for someone else to read, or you were studying it yourself, you might make a little note in the margin of what you were reading. 
Like many of us do this today, today with our Bibles, at least I hope you do. I hope your Bibles are nice and marked up, underlined, highlighted, you know, noted up in different ways. The difference is when you read your Bible today and you make a note of something, unless you write in typeset, it's very easy for us to figure out, okay, this is the print and this is your writing. But let's say you were writing, you were a copyist in the ancient world. And so you're writing these verses out and then you make a little note on the margin for yourself as, you know, this is just like a study thing, a little way to remember just the same reason that we make notes in our Bibles today. And so your little footnote there, it says something to the effect of, um, in your Bible, if you look at the bottom of your Bible, there should be a footnote. It says something to the effect of MSS. That means manuscripts. And for some of your notes, it might say that earlier manuscripts or MSS do not contain these verses. So we have this long history and record of all of the different manuscripts that the Bible is found in. And what happens is verse 5, John 5, 3b and 4 does not show up in any manuscript until 400 A.D. So all of the manuscripts before 400 A.D. do not contain those verses. And so like the King James Version, which is built on one particular manuscript, came out much later than 400 A.D., so they have that verse in there. But newer um, manuscripts, which offer uh, the opportunity to look at older manuscripts that were discovered since before or after, I should say, the, uh, the King James was written, we can look to those and determine, okay, no, here is what was passed on through the generations. This means that it was unlikely that uh, those verses were in the original Bible because nobody would have read it, taken it out for 400 years, and then put it back in 400 years later. The much more likely situation is somebody was copying it down. They put a little note in there about, hey, the reason why the, you know, they would wait for the water to stir is because of this angel. In literary, literary circles, this is called a gloss. So if you're ever watching Jeopardy and they're talking about, you know, what's, uh, this is a note that's made in an ancient manuscript, you can talk, oh, it's a gloss. Um, so now you know what it means. None of this means that we should doubt what we read in the Bible. Because even though it was likely not in the original text, I believe that with something as precious to God as his message to us, he is not going to allow us to mess it up. And so while there are differences between what was originally given and what we have today, I do believe what we have today is exactly what God wants us to have. So that means that whether this verse is supposed to be in there or not, you can read it. It's not going to like destroy your faith or increase your faith in any way. It's just, it's what we have and it's exactly what God wants us to have. I believe that without a doubt. So that explains verse 3b and 4. Okay, now we can go to verse 5. One man was there who had been disabled for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and realized he had already been there for a long time, he said to him, do you want to get well? We might read this statement and think, well, yes, of course he wants to be well. But have you ever known a person or been that person who while saying you want to be well, you have become accustomed to the pain? You're, you're used to the loss. You're, you understand the difficulty of your situation. When we think of this with regard to people in prison, we say that a person has become institutionalized, meaning that they want to be out of prison, and that's, but that prison is all they know. And so when they do get the chance to leave it, they realize uh, this freedom, it, it's, it, it, it confines them in some way and they want to get back to what they knew. They want to be out, but really they don't. How many of us have become institutionalized to sin? 
to loss, to pain, to struggle, depression, to worry, anxiety, to doubt, to anger, hatred, lust, so on. How many of us, if Jesus came to us and asked us, do you want to be well? We'd be like, well, yeah, but really we do not. And so we see it with this guy. Listen carefully and tell me if he answers if he wants to be well. Verse 7. Sir, the disabled man answered, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I'm coming, someone goes down ahead of me. That does not sound like a resounding yes to me. Do you want to be well? Well, I don't have anybody to help me. It comes across more as what somebody or someone would say when he has given up and resolved himself to his lot in life. Verse 8, Jesus told him, get up, pick up your mat and walk. So even after a very tepid response to Jesus, he still heals this guy. Don't tell the faith healers that this verse exists because it blows up their entire theology. Does it seem like this guy had the faith to be healed? Did Jesus heal this man because the, this lame man had shown such grace or, or faith? Does Jesus say something like, you see, this man has the greatest faith in all of Israel. Never before have I seen someone with this kind of faith. He was just lying there. Jesus comes along and asks him if he wants to be well. And the guy's like, well, listen to this sob song. Nobody knows the trouble I've seen. Surely a guy like this would never be healed if all it takes to be healed by God is for us to believe in it enough. And yet what happens? This guy with seemingly no faith, at least a faith that could even be mentioned, like John doesn't even talk about this guy's faith. Like it's, it's nowhere on the radar. Something else to think about here. Notice again in verse 3. It says there was a large number of paralyzed people in this place. And Jesus goes, and as far as we can tell from what's recorded, he only goes and heals one person. Yes, he could have healed more, and John just didn't write about it. That by all means, that could be the case. And John alludes to this at the closing of his gospel when he says, you know, there are so many other things that Jesus did and said that if I were to write them down, there's not enough books in all of the world to contain everything that he did. So yes, there's a possibility that Jesus healed more, but there is a large number of people and only one is recorded as being healed. We cannot blow past that fact. What all of this points to is that God is sovereign. God heals some people and he doesn't heal other people. He answers the needs of some who are not even asking. This guy wasn't asking Jesus to be healed. He's just laying there in his misery. And God addresses his need. And sometimes God will say no to those who are sincerely asking. And the sooner we accept that God cannot be controlled or cajoled or manipulated or forced into a corner or expected to act in a certain way, the sooner we realize that God really is sovereign and does not have to answer to us, then the sooner we can trust in all that he is doing, whether it is good or bad, we can see his sovereign desire for us coming about. <coughs> Verse 9. Instantly the man got well, picked up his mat, and started to walk. Now that day was the Sabbath. Do you see anything different here compared with how we view healings today? Instantly. Like there was absolutely no doubt. It wasn't like this guy stood to his feet and kind of like stumbled, uh, uh, stumbled around as he uh, had to be helped down the road. This guy who did not use his leg muscles for 38 years was able to get up and walk and carry the weight of his stuff as he walked away. Now, we have a physical therapist in our congregation, so, you know, she can check me on this, but I read it on the internet, so I know it's true. 
Muscle atrophy can begin to occur after just two to three weeks of disuse. Certainly after 38 years, this guy's muscles were non-existent. And yet instantly, no therapy, no gradual healing, no, oh, you know what, you'll get there someday. Instantly, this guy was healed. Now, I do not say this to imply that God does not work and heal through the efforts of medical professionals. He does. But do you also believe that God can instantly heal someone, that he has that kind of power to bring a paralyzed man with atrophied legs to walk? And can he still do that today? Yes, he can do that, and yes, he still does that. But what we have to recognize is that his healing ultimately comes from his providence, his sovereignty, and not from us or our ability to believe. Verse 10. And so the Jews said to the man who had been healed, This is the Sabbath. The law prohibits you from picking up your mat. Were you ever with someone who just doesn't get it? Like, the, these guys don't get it. Put yourself in this situation, like you're one of the bystanders. This guy who had been laying paralyzed 38 years, in that day and time, 38 years was a lifetime for many. The guy doesn't walk for 38 years. He's healed instantly. He got up, grabbed his stuff. I would like to think that you know, he, he was running and these Jews are like, nah, don't pick up your mat. You know, and this guy, he was like doing his best Forrest Gump out of there. He was running and you, you, could, you, you could see all of this happening. And then the Jews are like, what are you doing? You can't pick that up. And notice that they're not upset that someone had to bring him there. I mean, it took work to get him there. And the guy was set up in this colonnade. Um, he didn't get there himself. So somebody had to work to set up his bed, to, to carry him there, to lay him down. They did all of this other work, but who cares about that? The guy was healed, but holy cow, you just touched your straw mat and picked it up. These Pharisees, likely Pharisees, they see a guy healed and they just do not get it. They are more concerned with what the societal expectations are than what God is doing. And that's a warning for all of us Christians today. Verse 11. He replied, the man who made me well told me, pick up your mat and walk. Who is this man who told you, pick up your mat and walk? They asked. But the man who was healed did not know who it was because Jesus had slipped away into the crowd that was there. See, Jesus was like a ninja in some ways, and he could just poof, disappear. After this, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you are well. Do not sin anymore so that something worse doesn't happen to you. All right, that verse tends to throw some people off. I've heard some try to say that, you know, it was sin that caused this man to be paralyzed. And while certainly the effects of sin can be bodily harm, the, there's nothing in here that points that out. Instead, this is a warning. You see, Jesus is not talking about what could happen in this life. Jesus is telling a man, look, even though you lived a life that none of us would ever want... It would not matter if we had all of the money, all of the help in the world. I have a feeling that not many would be willing to trade the ability to get up and walk away for all of the money in the world. And this was 2,000 years ago. Think about how hard it would be today to be paralyzed. Now think about it 2,000 years ago. The life this man lived was not easy. It was not a good life. And yet Jesus tells him, if you keep on sinning, then what happens in the next life is going to make you wish that you had this life back. Waiting around for someone to pick you up and throw you into the water is going to seem like a wonderful thing compared to what can happen if you keep sinning. Folks, hell is a real place. 
And Jesus is here warning us that it is a terrible time for whatever horrible life we have here, Jesus tells us it's nothing compared to what can happen apart from God. Verse 15, the man went and reported to the Jews that it was Jesus who made him well. Therefore, the Jews began persecuting Jesus because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. Jesus responded to them, My father is still working, and I am working also. This is why the Jews began trying all the more to kill him. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father making himself equal to God. Two things here. Is it just me or does this guy come off as kind of, you know, really smarmy, kind of like, ugh, like I don't want to be around this guy. He was healed. And though it could have happened, we see no record of him thanking Jesus, praising God. Instead, what we read is that he went and told on Jesus. I mean, I don't know if this was one of those pearls before pigs things or not, but this does not sound that great for this guy. And the point that Jesus is making here is that even though God rested on the Sabbath, that does not mean that he stopped working. Did the sun still come up? that day? Does, did he still provide for all life? Did he still protect and care and love and watch over all things? God never stops doing. Even when he is at rest, he is still doing. So what I want to do before we turn to the application is look to uh, one of the ways that this story was pro, uh, portrayed in The Chosen. And the reason I wanted to read through the story first is because, as I said, um, in order to make the story kind of more dramatic, they have to take some liberties and they take some interpretation in order to, to fit the story into one particular story, if you will. So as we watch this, you know, the, the, the point of the story is still given, but I want you to be able to watch it and know, okay, this is scriptural, this is interpretation, this is from the Bible, this is interpretation. So go ahead, Jacob, go ahead and show the clip. One of the things I do uh, enjoy about the chosen are, is there like, is my mic not on or? Good? Doesn't sound like it. Did it die? I think the batteries are dead. Um, yeah, I'll use it. I'll use this one. It's going to die, though. There's no batteries. Um, so one of the things that I enjoy about The Chosen is their like the little attention to detail. And uh, the guy that was standing to, I guess it was Jesus' left, um, the guy that took out the book and started writing stuff down, that was John. And so it's, it's one of those interesting things where you're like, oh, that's how he wrote things like this down because he saw it and he was writing it down as it was happening. So some ways that we can apply these verses in our lives, um, some ways that the world uh, says that we should act one way, but Christ shows us Instead, we are to live as he lives, to be different, to be holy, and to follow after him. The first thing we see is that Jesus sees those who are unseen. And we too should go to those who cannot come to us. We should take notice of those who kind of fade into the background of this world. This man probably came to this pool who knows how many times during those 38 years. And did you notice how he said there was no one there to help him get to the water? He was alone. He was there at this religious place. Don't let that part like escape your, your thought here. A bunch of supposed holy people were gathered around. All these religious people would walk right past this guy. And I think that most everyone in here, if you saw a man paralyzed lying on the sidewalk downtown, you would do something about it. But what about the other hundreds of people we pass by every single day? The world tells us, you know what, forget about them. 
pass them by. What can you do about it? We might not be used by God to radically change someone like this man's life was, but then again, maybe we can. What was the greater issue here for Jesus? Making this man walk or giving him a warning about what could happen if he kept to his sinful ways. Christ saw this man as one who needed, uh, who he, his needs needed to be met. And he also needed to hear this warning. And as Christ saw this man, so should we see those around us and warn those around us. Another area of application is to see how Jesus went against the societal, the societal norms and expectations, especially when they run counter to God's expectations and norms. There was this religious oppression that the people were living under. There was political oppression as well, and, and, and lost in the hustle and bustle of trying to make a way in a very difficult world of the time, lost in all of that was God's way. There are lots of ways in which this world, even when it is in the name of religion or doing something good, there are lots of ways that if we lived according to those expectations, we would be living against what God would have for us. Church, are we willing to stand up and speak against the world when what they are asking or expecting of us run counter to God's ways? What would happen in this country, what would have happened in this country if the church had stood up 250 years ago and across this nation said slavery is a sin? What would have happened if the church really took the biblical teaching to heart that marriage is meant only for one man, for one woman, for life? What would happen if the church actually believed that people all around us are going to hell and spoke out about it, even though the world tries to tell us that no one wants to hear that message. How is Christ's example showing us that it is more important for us to live according to how Christ lived rather than how the Republican, Democrat, conservative, liberal, denominational, or historical ways say we should live and act? It was not by chance that this healing was on the Sabbath. It happened with a purpose. It was certainly to bless this man who was healed, but it was also for Christ to show that the world had it wrong. They were simply wrong and his way was right. And in showing people that God's way is right, that his ways are right, it helps us to see our last point for today. Jesus' example shows us how to see God through the noise of this world. Verses 17 and 18 again, please. Jesus responded to them, My father is still working, and I am working also. This is why the Jews began trying all the more to kill him. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal to God. The world will tell us to stop. It's not necessary. Don't pray for that person. Don't share Christ with that neighbor. Don't give of your time and money to something bigger than you. You just do you and don't pay no mind to anyone else. No one wants to hear why you have joy. You will make people feel bad if they know where your peace comes from. Don't help that person. They're just going to throw it in your face. Sometimes the noise can seem to come from a good spot as well. Don't say that what that person is doing is wrong. That's mean. As long as somebody believes in something, then who are we to say that they can be wrong? Just look out for your people, for your family. Give your children everything they want because that is love. Buy more, spend more, listen more, play more. The noise in this world can be overwhelming. And with all of the people telling Jesus that he shouldn't speak to that guy, I mean, what, what could this paralyzed guy offer the movement? 
with all of the people telling Jesus that he should not heal on the Sabbath, with all of the people saying that Jesus should be doing something more holy during the festival, with all of those voices saying, stop, don't do it, move on, think about it, through all of those voices, Jesus brings us back to the Father. People of God, can you hear what Christ is saying through the noise today? Rumors of war, racial strife, the noise of political arguments, the noise of a bad diagnosis, another tra tragedy, another death, another stroke, a heart attack, an unplanned pregnancy, a lost pregnancy, another loss of a job, another fight with your spouse, another child turning away from his or her parents, the noise of masks, no masks, one more variant, bad weather, an accident, a guy lying paralyzed on the ground for 38 years as everybody walks past him through all of that noise. Jesus Christ says, my father is still working and I am working also. So, do you believe that, church? Do you? There we go. Jesus shows us. He tells us, see those who are unseen. Jesus went against the societal norms and expectations when they ran counter to God's expectations and norms. And Jesus' example shows us that we can see God through the noise of this world, no matter how terrible it is, no matter how bad our life is at that moment. My Father is still working. I think we need to turn to God and ask Him, help me be reminded of these things and be able to live them out and look for the ways in which you want me to see others. Help me to see the ways in which the world is telling me to live one way, but I know your way runs counter to that. And God, help me to see you no matter what is going on, no matter how good or bad it is. Help me to see that you, my Father, my, my God in heaven, that you are still working. Will you please pray with me? Heavenly Father, we want to ask that you would help us to see you. God, we know that the world has its message to us. And there's a lot of people proclaiming that message. And Lord, we also know, we recognize that it distracts us from you. So God, help us to uh, not listen to the noise No matter how loud, how scary, how, how, um, how many are saying it to us, God, help us to see you through it. God, I pray that you would help us to see your ways clearly. Lord, that we would not live according to the expectations of this world, no matter how well-intentioned or evil they are. Lord, help us to live according to your ways. And God, I pray that you would help us to see those that this world just passes by. And we know that there are many reasons why the world says we shouldn't pay attention to them because they're not the right voting block. We shouldn't pay attention to them because they, they, they can't give us enough money we shouldn't pay attention to them because they're not educated enough. God, instead, help us to see all of those that you see. And Lord, help us to be willing to give the warning to all, to all of us, to, to everyone that we come into contact with, Lord. Help us to give that same warning to be bold enough to share the gospel, to say, look, do you understand this? That yes, this is a horrible world sometimes, but it is nothing compared to an eternity in hell. So God, help us to share the hope that we have in you. 
Help us. May we be a part of you bringing your, your healing touch to all of those around us, Lord. Work through us. Help us to see those that you want us to see and to speak obediently to all that you would have us say. We pray these things in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen.